The reason I was selected were for two reasons. One, um, the work I did on the National Science Foundation Network and the fact that that was kind of the launch pad for the public internet that we know today. And uh, it was a government contract from National Science Foundation and I was there when we built the network and I was also leading the project when we retired the network. That was the T1 and the T3 NSFNet backbone. Then I ended my career as the IANA and everyone I hope knows what that is who's listening to this video. <laughs> and that again was a government contract that had been in place since 1990s. And when I um, was getting ready to leave, ICANN had led an activity to help the US government retire or ex let that contract expire and the multi-stakeholder community to take over the running of the IANA functions. So I think that's why I really was nominated and was so happily uh, inducted, I guess I'll be inducted later today. Initially, I'd say the, the biggest uh, hurdle was lingo or language, because um, when I joined the National Science Foundation team at Merit, which is a state-funded consortium of universities in Michigan, um, I didn't have any background in networking. So <laughs> everyone was talking in acronyms all the time, and I didn't know what they were saying. So I had to kind of make a list of acronyms to real words, and it was like learning a foreign language to begin with. So, that's kind of silly, I know, but it took a while to get the right lingo. And then um, the other was, I don't think there was really any big hurdles because it was a very collaborative and cooperative time. Nobody was thinking of monetizing the internet at that point in time. The, some of the people uh, that were particularly important to helping me develop and giving me opportunities to become the person I became were um, Hans Werner Braun and Eric Opperly. Both of them were at Merit. They were a huge influence in my getting started. Um, Rob Blocksile from the Netherlands for RIPE was another um, person who helped me to mature as a networking person, an internet person. And then there was Jack Drescher from IBM. He was a very big influence in the early stages when we had a partnership with IBM and MCI to build the network. So I really hope that the internet can continue to have connectivity without bifurcation, that we don't have little internets everywhere. That was kind of what networking was before we started the TCP IP network, that you know you had a deck net and you had a um, an energy sciences network and you had a NASA sciences network and they didn't always communicate so the connectivity was kind of choppy. So I'm really hoping for the future that the internet can continue to be this collaborative and cooperative venture with open communications and I think sometimes politics gets in the way so I hope that the politicians will be smart enough not to ruin that. Be bold, <laughs> explore things, be willing to challenge um, the, the status quo. Not, not necessarily like throw everything out, not the baby with the bathwater, as we say, but uh, don't be afraid to experiment. You know, just because it's always been done one way doesn't mean that there might not be another way to approach the problem. And don't think things can't be done. Think that, you know, there's probably a solution out there. Maybe you won't find it. Maybe you'll fail. That's OK, because you'll learn something. So um, that's my advice for the future people who want to do what we were doing. Some of the applications that people have adopted. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought people would pay for ringtones? Somebody told me that early on, they were gonna make up this application and, and they say, yeah, wouldn't you pay a penny for a ringtone? I'm going, no, <laughs> why would I pay a penny for a ringtone? Or Angry Birds, I mean, everybody wants to play Angry Birds. <laughs> I just think some of the applications are adopted and are used like constantly. 
And it surprises me the things that um, I never thought people would care about. I think they're both the same thing almost. Privacy, I think, is one of the most challenging things that I, I'm concerned about, privacy and security on the internet. But I also think it's now something that's come to the forefront and people are beginning to worry about it. I, I'm concerned that, um, you know, I'm an older person, but younger people sometimes don't seem to think privacy is important. And I think they'll learn as they get older <laughs> that there's some things you don't want to have exposed later in your life. But I think that's becoming something that's um, more uh, acceptable. People are saying, oh yeah, well I don't want my social security number known. Whereas before, I think it was treated sort of lightly. And I think that's still a, a security as an issue. I think that um, I still hope that it'll be an open, communication mechanism with a connectivity to everyone, that there's no borders or, or um, barriers to people being able to communicate using the internet. But I think there has to be respect. And it's a, how do you balance that? How do you balance the, uh, the openness with um, people who abuse it? And that's, I think, a challenge but I think it's also that I hope it evolves so it somehow can find that balance to continue to have the connectivity and show ethical behavior by people who are using it.